So now we are in Parshat Emor. This is Leviticus chapter 21 through 24. There's some, um, there's some key points in here that I want to make. And uh, it is, it, it's not anything terribly, terribly new. Uh, it, it is some repeat stuff. But I think there's some stuff in here that I, that I feel that we need to remind ourselves about and kind of back up and just kind of get a gander at it and kind of, kind of feel it a little bit. So I'm going to go uh, to chapter 21 in the book of Leviticus, and it talks about the defilement of death. And uh, this, is, this, is really, uh, this is really important stuff. So I'm just going uh, to read chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, and then I'm going to skip to 16 and 17, just because those are the sections that I want to kind of highlight in here. So Leviticus 21, starting in verse 1, says, Then Yuvah said to Moshe, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, No one shall defile himself for a dead person among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother and his father and his son and his daughter and his brother, also for his virgin sister who is near to him because she has... Uh, had no husband, for her he may defile himself. Skipping down to verse 16, Then Yehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aharon, saying, No man of your offspring throughout their generations who has a defect shall approach to offer the food of his God. Now, these are two things that I, that I really wanted to pick out of Leviticus chapter 21. And here is what they are. The problem with death. We have, to, we have to understand, and this is speaking about the priests in the first part of this, that a priest, the sons of Aaron, may not defile himself for a dead person among his people except for his close relatives. God is not heartless. He's not saying that you priests can never come near a dead person. He's saying you need to be very careful with how much death you let into your vicinity. Death is anathema. It's a fancy word, meaning absolutely against God. God is an absolute God of life. Death is not in Him, near Him, nor can it be. And so, death, I think you need to, to, to try to remember that in the Hebrew concept, my understanding is, and this is pretty common in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew mind regarding the t- subject and the topic of death, is that death means separation. Death separates. When, you're, when you die, your spirit separates from your flesh. Um, death of a relationship. Two people split and separate. So continuously think in your mind when you think about death as separation. And God, death to God is absolutely anathema, but it is highly instructive for us. Death teaches us in so many different ways. Death is... I, I don't. Let me ask you, and if anyone wants to chime in here, I, I, I would love to hear anyone's insight regarding how might death be instructive for a believer. It is certainly something that we hate. Death is not good. We don't want to die, and we don't want anyone near us to die. But death is instructive. In what way would you say that death is instructive? Anyone? Angela says death makes you appreciate life. And I think that is a a big point that you need to keep in mind is that God often shows the power of things by using a contrast. Contrast is very powerful with God. And so remember that the adversary's domain is death. And God has allowed him seemingly to run amok. And just cause death everywhere that he goes. But this is the power of our God, that even his enemies do his will. This is the sovereignty of God. Remember that unity, the Hebrew concept of echad, 
one unification. This is the realm of God. Separation is the realm of the adversary. But we have to be down here on this planet fighting in the realm of the adversary and learning to do strength training through resistance. We have to resist the adversary. If you remember, Angela taught about this uh, years ago when she was looking at uh, Genesis chapter 1, I believe it was, that God uh, hides himself behind the veil of creation and he gave us an adversary in order to, to do resistance training. To learn to love. To learn to love. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. To learn to love, absolutely. To, um, to push back and fight against death and the culture of death and to, to embrace life in all senses. And so, when, y when Yuvah says to Moses, tell Aaron he needs to limit his exposure to death in any way possible because he is near me. And I think you can see in our previous studies regarding uncleanness and purification rituals going on in the temple that in almost every instance that I can think of, death, the whiff of death, the faintest brush of death needs to be purged from the person who would get near to God. God cannot have anything to do with death. Please, please, go ahead, Tracy. Oh, death can be instructive. Yes. Um, thinking about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, mm -hmm. and how um, the rich man in the parable realized he should have done differently as while he was alive and asked that Abraham would send Lazarus, whose name means help of God, which is a representative of the spirit, the helper, yeah. to his five brothers who are still alive. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great insight. Very good insight. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Thank you, Tracy. Um, anyone else have any comments on that? Yeah, I, to me, it's similar to what Tracy just said. Um, death, even though we, sh we should be aware that it is going to happen inevitably, we don't know when we're going to die. But Death is the beginning of eternity for us. And being aware of death and knowing it's the beginning of eternity, you want eternal life or eternal condemnation. So you must be aware of death. And by being aware of death, you have to be aware of Messiah Yeshua and keeping his commandments and living that life and being fruitful and living towards his and the Father's will. So that you know that when death comes upon you, you won't have fear of that death that you know that you'd be going to a, a good place. So it's, it's like a marker for yeah. the beginning of the real life, the real eternity, yes. the life that won't end. Yep, that is, the, that, is absolutely, that is absolutely right. Yeah, it is the beginning of the real. And I have heard uh, other teachers say this, and I agree with this, this uh, concept 100%, is that this that you are living right now, this is not real. This is fake news. The spiritual realm and what's happening in the realm of God and in the spirit, that's real. And that's, uh, that when, what's that? It, yeah, that's a great way to look at it. This life that you're living is a parable, and that when you know when that veil is ripped, and the spiritual and the physical begin really to connect when the kingdom of God is established, then you're going to see the real. This is not real. This is a testing ground. This is a this is just a test. <laughs> so this is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. So pay attention. <laughs> Get up closer, Mikey. From this first, well, hey, you know what? Normally at your house, you guys can barely hear me. 
This is true. So you're going to have to really eat that microphone, buddy. <laughs> Yes. So I don't know if there's, you know, kind of a parallel here. I, I, yeah, I totally agree with that, Mikey. And I don't remember if it was you that I was talking to or Angela. Or I think Angela and I were talking about that last week when we were talking about, uh, you know, ritual impurity and needing to be uh, cleansed of impurity, that, that there was that, that idea of Mary approaching um, Yeshua before he had gone up as a first fruits offering to the Father, and that he could not be corrupted by that that death. Uh, so yeah, there's something there for sure. I'm not exactly sure what to make of it, but there's there's definitely something there. Yep. And if death is separation, and if death is separation, then Adam did die. Then Adam the day he ate, the day he ate of that fruit. In a, in a spiritual sense, he lost his connection with God. He became separated from God. That is, that is absolutely true, that he did indeed die when he ate that. And yeah, God is going to define what death is. And, and we may have a, a little bit of a misconception what death is. We think it's the death of, you know, the death of our flesh. Uh, when he's thinking, no, death is the, the separation between you and me. That's death. And so we, that's, I think that's the definition of, uh, of eternal life and eternal damnation is eternal separation from God and eternal uh, connectivity to God. So that's, that's certainly something to look at. Um, you know, the next point here is from, ver- from verse 16 is talking about the problem with deformity. This is telling us, uh, and, the, and the verse is continuing through 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 and a little bit further, uh, that talking about the, uh, that, that a priest cannot uh, serve in the temple if he is deformed in any way. If there is something wrong with him physically, he cannot come near. Now that seems really odd to us because we are like, oh, does God hate crippled people? (laughs) What's going on with that? I mean, even if you have a, a... a bent leg or a crushed testicle. How would you even know? Certainly you're wearing your underpants. No one's going to know that. But he's not, you cannot approach this God with deformity. So, and I know that that just seems to smack of, wow, that just doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem nice. So, you know, what do you make of this? I say to myself, okay, um, deformity is commonly seen as a result of sin and the corruption of sin. Okay, that is a very, very common biblical idea because we have multiple examples uh, where God puts an affliction upon someone because of sin. Now, we do have one example of Yeshua saying it was neither him nor his parents who sinned and that was why he was born blind to give glory to God. Now, you have to look at that and you have to say, okay, is he speaking uh, is he speaking in a causal sense or a commentative sense? Is he commenting on this and using this as a teachable moment or is he saying, hey, corruption just happens. God didn't you know, afflict someone. I am undecided about that. Just because this guy was born blind does not mean necessarily, it certainly could be true, that God allowed or caused, what's the difference, this guy to be born blind just for the purpose of allowing the Messiah Yeshua to heal him and have an impact on the people around him with his testimony. There's nothing more important, nothing more powerful than your personal testimony of what God has done for you. You've heard me say that to you before. Your words 
and telling them what the Bible says is not nearly as powerful as what God has done for you. So, is it true that God, that is literally what he was telling us here, is that God allowed this guy to be blind for the sake of that? Certainly possible. Or it could have just been an instructable moment, and that all deformity and decrepitude is a result of sin. Someone's sin, or just sin in general, infecting the whole world. Duh. Obviously, sin is, is, is it infecting everyone, and we all have various ailments and problems as a result of sin. Sometimes. Sometimes not. Who knows? But the problem is, that's the problem with the, the priests not being able to approach God because that is a physical, unfortunately, whether, whether for good or ill, whether you like it or not, it is being viewed in a spiritual sense that deformity is representing something spiritual to God. Because, Angela says, the spiritual is always manifesting in the physical. But that smacks to us of something that's just terribly unfair. Because we see poor crippled children who are born with diseases and such, and we think, my, that's just terrible. It is unfair. You mean God can't have a relationship with someone who's a cripple? Of course not. That's ridiculous. But God is demonstrating here that He is pure and he must have, he, he demands a relationship that is pure of death and the effects of sin and the deformity that comes from sin with the people who draw near to him. Now, this is where you spiritualize this component and you say, let's move it away from the physical because the physical teaches the spiritual that you must be untouched by death. And if you are in the Messiah, you are passed from death to life, the scripture says. Your deformities, they might be temporary. They are in the flesh now. They are trapped in the flesh so that when your new body is coming, this flesh is gone and is destroyed. And your new flesh is, in, is, is impeccable. It's perfect. It is not a deformity in any way. And it has no stench of death on it. And that you need to approach God now, having cleansed yourself. He cleanses you. You have to keep yourself from being defiled, excuse me, of the stench of death, the stench of sin, the stench of deformity. Spiritualize these things, and I think it makes more sense. At least it does to me. The, the nose, for example, Angela has talked about, the, there was a, a section where it's like he has no bridge of his nose or something. Angela has a, that, to me, that speaks of uh, having spiritual discernment. Yeah, because I think that in the Hebrew, uh, you know, the ears are obviously about hearing the word of God and the, the nose is the sense of spiritual discernment. So, uh, and so it, I would suggest to you absolutely that if you look through this list of deformities in this chapter, you could very easily see some spiritualized component to each one of them, and it represents something different. Well, you think about the Angela, process. go ahead. Me? Yes, you. Um, I was just going to, as you were talking, I was just thinking about how, how all of this is a, is a type and shadow of the true. Mm -hmm. This is all parable of the true. And in the kingdom and in his presence, because this is in regards to drawing near to Yahweh, be no maimed, there will be no pain, there will be no hurt, and so it's kind of this, in my mind, I'm thinking about it being him trying to illustrate what it will be like in that spiritual realm, that mm. this will not be able to come near to him, and it won't even be there, right. for that matter. Yep, absolutely. Angela, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah Angela was going to just say a couple of words here. I'm not sure about the other deformities that are mentioned, but the one about the nose really uh, communicated to me how this could be spiritualized. And Alan started to explain that a little bit, but when you think about uh, your nose being the, the symbol for discernment, you have to think about, okay, you walk into a room, you walk into a house, your nose picks up on things your eyes cannot see. It smells the gas leak. It smells that there's a dead body somewhere. It smells that there's something rotten in the trash. It picks up on things you cannot see. And so if 
if you if you can understand the nose as being the discerning force that picks up on the unseen and then jump over into the spiritual now you don't want a priest who cannot pick up on the unseen the spiritual the spiritual discernment thank you angela good good very good insight um I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, again, you guys, I think that if you don't mind my saying so, this whole section that we're going to be studying tonight is really connecting the spiritual and the physical. It's really teaching us about the spiritual with all of this physical stuff that we're, that we're talking about. Dig into it a little bit. I'm just picking out the examples here and there to, to kind of point out to you. But uh, really begin to think about these things because the, sp- the physical is always instructing us in the spiritual realm. And this is what Messiah did all the time in regard to the Torah. He brought it to a deeper spiritual level to help us really see the heart of the Father in, this, in the words. So uh, with your gracious permission, I'm going to move forward just a little bit. Now, in chapter 22... I'm going to read a little bit from this, which is uh, verses 1 through 3, I believe. And then I'm going to jump forward a little bit in verse 10. So take a look at this. It says in Leviticus chapter 22, Then Yehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, Tell Aaron and his sons to be careful with the holy, that word gifts is in italics, the holy things, the holy period, of the sons of Israel, the holiness, the holy things of the sons of Israel, which they dedicate to me, so as not to profane my holy name. I am Yehovah. Say to them, if any man among all your descendants throughout your generations approaches the holy things which uh, the sons of Israel dedicate to Yehovah, while he has an uncleanness, that person shall be cut off from before me. I am Yehovah. And then jumping down to verse 10, no layman however, is to eat the holy. These are talking about the holy offerings, the holy food of the priests. A sojourner with the priest or a hired man shall not eat of the holy. But if a priest buys a slave as his property with his money, that one may eat of it. And those who are born in his house may eat of his food. Tell me that isn't just jumping off the page to you before I even open my mouth, okay? This physical teaching the spiritual. First of all, I want to point out a couple of things. What is a layman? In verse 10 it says, no layman is to eat of the holy. Now what is a layman? Now that is a weird word that we don't usually use very often, A layman simply means uh, a non-specialist. Like in the Catholic Church days, the priest or the the parson or, you know, the deacon or whatever, he's a specialist. But everybody else, the great unwashed masses, are called laymen. The nobodies, the, the, the average common Joe. But interestingly enough, that word does not actually exist in the Hebrew text. Um, if in, and most English translations will actually use the word layman in verse 10. But that word does not exist there. The Hebrew word is czar. The Hebrew word is czar, and that is an outsider. An outsider is not to eat of the holy. A sojourner. A hired man shall not eat, shall not partake of the holy. But if a priest purchases a servant with his money and he becomes his property, then he may partake of the holy things. Now, would someone totally like to preempt me? I know you guys are super smart, and one, some, one of you out there has got to be chomping at the bit because you know exactly what this is referencing. Who's going to help me out here? Don't be scared. It's okay. Don't be scared. Hey, I'll help you out. 
Thank you, Keith. Yeah, Yeshua purchased me so I can, I can participate. That's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You got to be a member of this family. You got to be grafted into this family, purchased as a servant, as part of this family, or you cannot partake of the holy things. You can't just be passing through and decide you're going to partake of the holy things. That, to me, is part and parcel of what we've been talking about for years now, which is you are grafted in to the family of faith. You, are, you have become a spiritual Israelite. What is a Jew, Paul says? Paul says a Jew is one who is one inwardly. Angela? That word is, is that word czar the sh- same one for czar as strange fire uh, from, from Nadav and Avihu? That's a great question. I don't have the uh, materials in front of me to look that up, but perhaps someone could take a look at that for me uh, to look at uh, in the previous section and just pipe in whenever you do, because Angela had a question regarding whether this word czar in verse 10, as a layman, actually an outsider, uh, is the same Hebrew word as what was used with Nadav and Avihu, their strange fire. Um, I don't actually have my notes from the previous week on me, and I don't want to switch my program around. Uh, no, I don't have... Yeah, I... It, it sounds similar, but I don't know that it is actually the same word. I found it. You found it? Because it's Zur. Zur? That's so it similar. It does mean stranger. Oh, yeah, okay. It has a vav in the middle of it, though. Okay, it has a vav in the middle of it. It's similar, but it has a vav in the middle of it. Okay, so it's a different word. But good question. Good question. Um, so, yeah, being purchased by the priest. Yeshua, our priest has certainly purchased us by His blood and enabled us to take part in the holy things. Uh, we can enter into the veil and draw near, for the, near to God for the purpose of our petitions and our prayers and our fellowship with Him. Uh, but we do have to be careful when we draw near to God. This is, the, this is the thing that I think we have to really watch out for, is God, as is demonstrated by the situation with Nadab and Abihu, that the closer you get to God the more purified you must be. He purifies you. Always, always, always remember that. He purifies you. You keep yourself from becoming defiled. To the, to the extent that you become better and better at controlling your flesh and living in the Spirit and getting control of your flesh and living in the Spirit, you are able to get draw nearer to God. I absolutely believe that. But... It becomes it becomes a little bit more dangerous. Go, who, what was that? That it's all in regards to his holiness. Yes. And I know I mentioned this before that he wants us to draw near to him. That's why he said, "Be holy, for I am holy." Right. <laughs> yeah. I like that imagery very much. The only way to get near the fire of God is to be on fire yourself. <laughs> that's, that's a beautiful picture. I think that's fantastic. Um, very, very good insight. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm going to move forward to everyone's favorite chapter, Leviticus 23. Now, these are about the appointed times. And I know that... I know that we have studied these, I don't want to use the word ad nauseum, but I just did, I apologize. Um, we, everybody, it seems like everybody who's been in the, in the Hebrew roots or Messianic Judaism or whatever for even five minutes 
That's when they get, they get down on the appointed times. Uh, the Moedim, the feast days of U of Ah. And it's, and it's exciting and it's new and it's different. And then the excitement wears off and you're like, okay, what are we doing here? I, I, I just want to, and, and so I'm not going to teach, you know, what these things are because we're all familiar with them. But I think as, as, as has been our uh, topic of discussion this evening, letting the physical teach the spiritual, I want to draw a couple of things forth from this text to remind us that this needs to be practical, okay? So I'm just going to read this little section here. It's right at the beginning of Leviticus chapter 23. Yehovah spoke again to Moshe, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, Yehovah's appointed times which you shall proclaim, keep that word in mind, as holy convocations, keep that word in mind, my appointed times are these. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy convocation. You shall not do any work. It is a Sabbath to you of ah in all your dwellings. These are the appointed times of you of ah, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. Okay, there's two words there that are popping out at you. Those are proclaim and convocations. So those are the two words that popped out to me, and I'm just going to deal with them a little bit. First of all, to get a running start here, what does it mean to proclaim? You know, if you look at that Hebrew word, uh, proclaim, it is the Hebrew word tikreu. Tikreu, like tikra. You've heard this word before. Um, you'll, you'll get my meaning here in just a moment. Are, you, are we proclaiming the appointed times of our Father? And I'm, I, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. These are not Jewish feasts. These are not Jewish holidays. These are the times, the seven well, not seven, eight times throughout the year when God wants to meet with you. These are his times, and he wants to meet with you, especially on these times. Not only at these times, but especially at these times. So we need to proclaim in our word and in our deed regarding these times, who our God is and what it means to fellowship with Him in these times. The danger of only spiritualizing the commands of God is that it's kind of like saying, I have a feeling of warmth and love and compassion for my wife. That is the real to me. That is real to me, that feeling that I have of love towards my wife. Now, she doesn't need me to tell her that I love her. She doesn't need me to show her that I love her. She just needs to know somewhere inside of herself that I feel love for her. Right? No, she's about to kick me. She's about to throw things. That don't mean nothing. <laughs> that's what she said. That don't mean nothing. Yeah, but that's unfortunately what we have a tendency to do with the holy things that we read about in the Torah of Moshe. We say, oh, everything in the Torah has been spiritualized by the Messiah Yeshua. Well, that's like saying... I have a feeling of love for my wife, but I'm not going to tell her and I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to feel it. I know it's there. I feel it. Therefore, that's what matters. Uh, that's not going to work for your wife. It's not going to work for your husband. It's not going to work for your children. And it is most assuredly not going to work for your God. So, you're looking at me with a puzzled look on your face and that's okay. I can't see you. I'm just kidding. 
But when you look at these these feasts, and we'll start right here with the feast of the the the, well, the first feast is the Sabbath day. I, I I was going to yes, but you, could you go ahead? No, you throw in. Angela wants to throw in something briefly. Go ahead. Proclaim is used over and over again when he's making the physical world at the right beginning of the Bible. Yes, Angela says he, proclaimed is the word that is used over and over again when he is creating the physical universe. He proclaims the day. He proclaims he this, night. and he proclaims, he proclaims the day. The he proclaims the heavens. This is this is what God is doing, not what He's thinking, not what He's feeling. This is this is this word, this Hebrew word, uh, tikreu, is ushering all of these things into existence by His words and then labeling it. So this is most especially concerned with action. And you have heard before, love is an action. It's a verb. It's not a noun. And I think you just you'll do well to remember that. But think about the, now. Now, how can we extrapolate these from these physical principles? What it means that we should do something physically and spiritually, because he wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. And I would also add. I don't want to add to the words of the Messiah, but I'm going to. In reality, not just in spirit and in truth, but in real life, doing what God says to do. Okay. I, that's, I, mean, I know I'm on dangerous ground, but I think I'm fairly safe. I think that's part of truth. <laughs> I think that's part of truth. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, mm-hmm. So, when he says the Sabbath day, um, I know that it is, it is generally the opinion of most Christians to say, Jesus is my rest, and he's the Lord of the Sabbath, and therefore he had the power to change the Sabbath, and so I rest every day. And I, um, you know, every day is a Sabbath day. Well, nothing, it, it, nothing is holy. If every day is holy, then nothing is holy. Because that's, you know, this is a holy day. This is a set-apart day. This is a special day. And if every day is a day of rest, then no day is a day of rest. And, and, this, is, and this is needing to be taken both physically and spiritually. And I don't think God gave this to you necessarily so that you would have a physical rest for your body. I think that's just a byproduct, but it certainly does help. It certainly does help. I can tell you very much that I I have a fantastic sense of wellness and, and well-being around me on the Sabbath day. I sleep better. <laughs> it's just everything is better on the Sabbath day. And it's not for no reason that this is a spiritual picture of the seventh day millennial rest of the kingdom coming. Uh, So what does it mean literally, though, in the temporal sphere? It means don't work. It says so very clearly. Do not work. Do not do your work unless you're an emergency worker or you are offering service where people's life, liberty, and freedom is at stake, if you do not do your work on the Sabbath day, then don't. And I don't, and you certainly could be an emergency worker, a police officer, a nurse, um, you know, or, or do something that if you don't help your client or your boss or something on the Sabbath day, then you're actually doing harm to them, then you should definitely work on the Sabbath day. Because that is the instructions of our Messiah Yeshua. If your friend's donkey has fallen into a ditch on the Sabbath day, you don't just say, oh, sorry, dude, come and get me tomorrow. Okay, so, but otherwise, if you are not, quote unquote, an essential worker, (laughs) then you stay home on the Sabbath day. You stop working. Sorry, I don't mean stay home. You don't have to stay home. I don't don't mean that. Um, I mean stay home from work. Don't work. Now, what about this? Here's the other thing. If you, you know the instructions, that means not only do you not work, you're not allowed to have your servants work. You're not allowed to even have your animals work. You're not allowed to have anyone serve you. Unfortunately, that means going to the movies, going to dinner, going to lunch, going to, do, to the amusement park. I know that that is irritating to to many people. It's like, well, that's just ridiculous. I'm terribly sorry. I'm not making up the rules. I'm just telling you what they are. If you're saying to someone by your testimony, I observe the Sabbath day, 
what's good for you is not good for me. What's good for me is not good for you. You're being a hypocrite. So don't do it. You're elevating yourself above them. them, And that is that is not appropriate either. So, you know, if you're going to observe the Sabbath day, do it for real. Now, then we go to the spiritual. What is the spiritual import of the Sabbath day? It's profound. It has to do with that seventh day of rest. And the, the Messiah Yeshua, the he, book of Hebrews, talks about this. Entering into his rest. That is a purely spiritual concept. That has nothing to do with observing the Sabbath day physically. That has to do with resting in the finished work of the Messiah Yeshua when he sat down at the right hand of God, having completed his sacrificial offering as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, we are able to enter into into his rest. So what does that look like on a practical sense for us if you want to bring that spiritual aspect of it into existence? Well, maybe that means that, you know, when you look at that word holy convocation, that's the second part of this, uh, what is a holy convocation? Well, the word convocation can mean two different things. It can mean a gathering, a gathering of people, or a reading. Now, you might say, okay, uh, so I should gather with other believers. That has traditionally been what has happened in a lot of cases. Uh, and I think that, that you can see in Jewish history, at least, that when the Israelites began to move into the land uh, and begin to move further away from the actual tabernacle, it was no longer practical for everybody to you know, go towards the tabernacle and meet. And uh, it, it began to be uh, smaller individual meetings in people's homes, and then eventually you got the synagogue. That's why they invented the synagogue, is so that people could have a holy convocation on the Sabbath day uh, to get together, because they're commanded to. And you can't travel to Jerusalem every Saturday. So that became a practical point. Now the second uh, meaning of the word convocation is reading. Now you you so that could reading of the scriptures. Now I would not say one is to the exclusion of the other. I think it's a great idea to read, to enjoy fellowship with family, to enjoy fellowship with others, to to pray, to have a closer relationship with God. These remember are the times that God has set aside for Himself, for His people, for fellowship amongst themselves and amongst believers and their God. So there needs to be, and there should be, both a physical and a spiritual aspect of it. You should be being fed both physically and spiritually in regard to the Sabbath day. Any comments, questions, or concerns about that one? Vaikra, I absolutely do. Yes. Well, what does the word Vaikra mean? And he called and he proclaimed. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great observation, Mikey. Uh, what would you What would you say about it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a, it's the it's the similar same root. I would say either similar or the same root, uh, but you know it's it's obviously got some sticky Hebrew letters on there that make it slightly different, which is tikreu for proclaim, but it's essentially the same thing. So yeah, I think that that's a you know it, it's so deep when you think of it that way uh, as proclaiming, having a convocation. I mean, your convocations actually proclaim; they're they're they work together beautifully. Did you have anything else about that, Mikey? Okay, now, good, good observation. Uh, so here's the, here's the next one, Passover. And in fact, the second Passover is, I believe, tonight. Uh, many people start it tonight and others started it last night. Remember that outside of the land of Israel, they often do double feast days. So... Uh, you can, you can, if you didn't, if you did not have an opportunity to observe the Passover in the first month, 
uh, then you would be celebrating it now. So, um, you know, here, and, and I want to do the same thing for just a couple of these. I, I don't want to go through each one of the, the eight separate, there are seven, there's one that happens every week. And then the other, the other set, there, there are seven, uh, holy days, but the, the, the Sabbath is thrown in there as, as one of them, kind of. So uh, it's set apart times, holy times, if you want to call it that. Uh, but I just want to go through a couple of them, uh, not, not, not all of them, but for example, um, Passover, because I think this is my, this was my point. If I didn't make it clearly enough, uh, previously is that, you know, we get excited about the feast days of the Lord. Uh, but then we can, we can kind of be sometimes a little bit confused about exactly what it is that we're supposed to be doing. Okay. So I thought I would just review a little bit to, you know, to just remind us, you know, for, for Passover, in the temporal, in the physical, we're supposed to be eating a meal. We're supposed to be eating a meal. We're supposed to be reading or telling the story of the Exodus and removing leaven from our homes. That is the literal, physical thing, just as clear as a bell that we are supposed to do. Now, there are additional things regarding the, the, the tabernacle and the temple that, which are not applicable to us at this time. Uh, but to physically do something, to literally physically observe the Passover, you need to have a meal and you need to recount the story of the Exodus. That is the part of it. And remove the leaven from your home. Now, taking that into the spiritual realm, uh, that means giving thanks for your redemption and remembering Yeshua, our Messiah, our Passover lamb. And both of these can be done by prayer and by telling his story and connecting these stories. Uh, that's what it means to me, at least, to have both the physical, temporal, and the spiritual aspects of the Passover so that these things come together and teach us one the other. Am I, am I making sense to anyone out there? Does anybody have a comment, question, or concern about that one? Okay, I think that's fairly self-explanatory. And again, I'm just, as by way of reminder, unleavened bread, okay? Temporal, in a literal sense, we remove the leaven from our home. We eat unleavened bread. We have a holy convocation on the first and the last days of these seven days. And we do no work on the first and the last of these seven days. These are the things that we are required to do in a physical sense. In a spiritual sense, what do we say? What does leaven represent? It can represent sin. It can represent false teachings and doctrines of men. We give thanks for the forgiveness. We give thanks for the redemption. So there are both physical and spiritual elements to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasts for seven days. Then we go to Yom Habikarim, the day of the first fruits offering. In the temporal, you take of your first fruits of grain, in this case the barley harvest, and you, give, you wave it before the Lord, uh, and that portion goes to support the priest. He eats his portion of it, but he also waves a portion of it. And in the spiritual sense, we're talking about the offering prayers for thanksgiving for the provision that God provides for us. Uh, and, I, and I know that, that, that the, uh, the same thing, in, and I'm just going to kind of lump these two together because Yom HaBikarim and the Feast of Shavuot, now Shavuot have some different things to it, but they are both harvest-type festivals wherein you're waving the first fruits of the barley harvest, which we know that our Messiah Yeshua was a first fruits offering of those raised from the dead. So there are physical and spiritual elements to this that need to be emphasized. And on Shavuot, you got the same thing. No work during the day of Shavuot. Uh, and, and now we don't grow, I mean, none, none of us are farmers. We're not growing crops. We don't have grain crops. Uh, we don't have vineyards and orchards. Are we supposed to wave something before the Lord? Uh, well, you know, if you wanted to, go ahead. Wave your paycheck. <laughs> Wave your paycheck. If, you, if the Lord is providing you with sustenance through a paycheck, 
Wave it. Whatever God is providing you. We can't say, well, just because I'm not a farmer, this doesn't apply to me. I don't have uh, grain to wave before the Lord. Well, is the Lord providing for your needs? And I don't say literally you should be waving your paycheck before the Lord necessarily, but it may be in a physical, in a, in a spiritual sense, giving thanks to God in a special way on the first fruits offerings of Bikarim and the Shavuot offering of the wheat harvest, that, that you give a special thanks for God providing for your needs. And I can tell you this, that this coming Shavuot, which is coming up in probably another 20 days. It's coming up at the end of this month on the 30th or the 31st, I think. Um, you know, we'll be hopefully, if, if, uh, if all is well and God continues to bless us, we'll be coming out from under this uh, coronavirus pandemic. And we'll have a real need to give great praise and thanks to God for having seen us through this most challenging and difficult time and providing for our needs through whatever means. If it means that God provided you through the means of a stimulus check from Donald Trump, then give glory to God. If it means that somehow somebody was able to help you and loan you some money, give glory to God. If you had money saved up that you were able to live on and make it through this challenging time, give glory to God. If you were able to keep working and your money flow was not interrupted at all, give glory to God. Give thanks on the day of Shavuot. And I fully anticipate that someday on Shavuot, the Lord is going to again send forth His Spirit I think that that, that uh, day of Pentecost, when they all began to speak in different languages, and, and, and Peter says, hey, this is what was you know, prophesied in the book of Joel. In those days, uh, your old men will see visions, and your young men dream dreams, and all this stuff. I think that was a partial fulfillment. I think that someday, very likely on the day of Shavuot, God will once again pour forth His Spirit upon His servants to empower them by His Spirit to do His work in the midst of challenging times. It could be this Shavuot. It could be the next Shavuot. But we should always have a sense of anticipation of what's going to happen on Shavuot. Because that's one of the ones that's coming up, I think. Yom Teruah. Yom HaKippurim. Sukkot. These things are coming up here in the fall. These are all really wonderful prophetic shadow pictures. And I'm not going to go through each one of these and, and, and do a, you know, a physical versus a spiritual breakdown. I just wanted to kind of whet your appetite and get you to think about these things in a sense that is practical, physical, and spiritual learning from the practical and the physical. We have to take these as physical and spiritual. Don't neglect the physical because you think you got the spiritual figured out. I can guarantee you that you don't. You will learn and you will grow in your spiritual dimension by observing the physical. I'm going to... Yeah, so does anyone have any comments, questions, or concerns regarding chapter 23? Okay, you've heard it all before, and you're in good shape. I appreciate that. Going forward, who is it? It's Darla. What's up, Darla? It's peanut. It's peanut. <laughs> And um, I was, for what came to me was like for Shabbat, it's time to stop and relax and set yourself apart from the world unto God. Mm -hmm. And then the next one, um, Passover, would be to remember 
what he's done for his people. Yep. And unleavened bread is um, to find sustenance on what he provides for us. Absolutely. And first, to give him the best of all we do, and Shavuot to be led by his spirit um, as we walk out his word and give thanks to him. Yom to rule like would be to statement. acknowledge him as king. Um, Yom Kippur to um, repent and be holy and Sukkot to celebrate and rejoice in him. Well, that if you stick those all together, you've got a mission statement. Yeah. That is, that is your mission statement. And I think that is a beautiful recitation, uh, Carla. That is awesome, awesome, awesome. So I, I recommend that you, you take notes on that and you stick all of those things together because that is your mission statement. All of those things run together into one short paragraph. That's your mission on this planet. All of it, all together. Beautiful insight. Beautiful insight. Anyone else? Okay. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to um, take a look at the lamp, the bread, and blasphemy. Chapter 24 is the end of this section, and it's fairly short, so I'm going to actually read it for you, uh, the whole thing. So it's story time. You ready? Here we go. Leviticus 24. Then Yuvah spoke to Moshe, saying, Command the sons of Israel that they bring to you clear oil from beaten olives for the light to make a lamp burn continually. Outside the veil of testimony in the tent of meeting, Aharon shall keep it in order from evening to morning before Yuvah continually. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. He shall keep the lamps in order on the pure lampstand before Yuvah continually. Then you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six to a row, and the pure table on the pure gold table before Yuvah. You shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be a memorial portion for the bread, even an offering by fire to Yuvah. Every Sabbath day he shall set it in order before Yuvah continually. It is an everlasting covenant for the sons of Israel. It shall be... Dude, dude, dude. Sorry. Um, Every Sabbath day he shall set it in order before Yuvah continually. It is an everlasting covenant for the sons of Israel. It shall be for Aharon and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from Yuvah's offerings by fire, his portion forever. Now the son of an Israelite woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the sons of Israel and the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel struggled with each other in the camp. The son of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name and cursed. So they brought him to Moshe. Now his mother's name was Shelomith, the daughter of Debri of the tribe of Dan. They put him in custody so that the command of Yuvah might be made clear to them. Then Yuvah spoke to Moshe, saying, Bring the one who has cursed outside the camp, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head. Then let all the congregation stone him. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If anyone curses his God, then he will bear his sin. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of Yuvah shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. The alien, as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. If a man takes the life of any human being, he shall surely be put to death. The one who takes the life of an animal shall make good, life for life. If a man injures his neighbor, just as he has done, so it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he has injured a man, so it shall be inflicted on him. 
Thus, the one who kills an animal shall make it good, but the one who kills a man shall be put to death. There shall be one standard for you. It shall be for the stranger as well as the native, for I am Yuvah, your God. Then Moshe spoke to the sons of Israel, and they brought the one who had cursed outside the camp and stoned him with stones. Thus the sons of Israel did, just as Yuvah had commanded Moshe. Now, there, this is a difficult and troublesome passage. There's a lot of confusion here. Um, I think, I'm not going to go deep on this because we're, we're running low on time and I don't want to keep you too late. But just think about this. The elements of the menorah and the light of the world, Yeshua, there are so many elements connecting those things. Uh, the fact that the olive oil is beaten. And you would think it would be crushed or pressed, but the Hebrew word means beaten. I don't know, it doesn't quite make sense, but any time that the word, it, it, that, the, uh, that the, the Bible talks about olive oil, it talks about the oil being from beaten olives. Uh, so there's just some very interesting uh, insights that can be gleaned by connecting the olives being crushed to give off this this uh, pure oil that is for burning in the in the in the in the uh, the, the menorah and the, and and there's some words in there. I think I'll back this up just a little bit so you can see. Oops, uh, that, that that it doesn't necess- It does not mean if you look at this that that the lampstand is to be before the Lord continually burning like all the time. Um, it literally is from the evening until the morning continuously, as in, uh, the literal Hebrew word is tamid, which is uh, to, to, as, a, as, a, as a rote practice, something that happens continuously. So the, the menorah is tended and lit in the evening, and it burns in the tabernacle all night long. It does not burn during the day. Uh, so you can look that up. And and just there's there's that is also another picture, and I'm going to get totally sidetracked and go a little too deep on that. I got I got to back down, look into it yourself. Fascinating stuff. I definitely encourage you to do that. Um, now, blasphemy, and this guy, you know, blaspheming the name. He blasphemed the name. Now, we know what our Hebrew brothers and sisters long ago did with this command, with this incident. They said, you cannot say the name uh, yud heh vav at all, or we will stone you to death. And I'm sure this is bringing to your mind Monty Python. Uh, it's quite funny. It, it's not funny, though. But, you know, here's, here's, here's one thing that I would say. I don't know what this means exactly other than to say, you know, to speak evil of Yehovah, to just flat curse Yehovah. I mean, I can, I can picture that in my mind. Uh, a, a person who is just vile and hateful towards God uh, would speak in a derogatory, negative, and cursing way uh, without it necessarily having to do with the four Hebrew letters Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey at all. Just a matter of speaking in a blasphemous way about our God. I don't necessarily think that it has anything to do with Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey. Because name, also means- because name means reputation. So it sounds to me like this guy was, was denigrating and talking trash about our God. Whether by name or not. What was that? Nietzsche, yeah, Nietzsche's in big trouble. Um, so that is, I think, what is going on here, is that he was cursing the character and talking trash about our God, and God said, yeah, you, you, anybody who curses me and denigrates me and hates me is going to die, and here's a perfect example of that. Now, one thing that I will, that I will tell you um, you know, it, it, some people have gone so far as to say, you know, I, I, boy, I, man, I can't believe that this whole time the capital L-O-R-D was in our Bible and we didn't even really realize that it was actually God's name and His name is Yehovah and boy, we just need to say it all the time now. Okay, fine. 
I'm fine with that. I say Yehova all the time, and I know that you do too. But I do have to tell you this. If you are interacting with a Jew who would be mightily offended by your using the name of his God in that way, I would strongly advise you not to. And I think Peter or, or Paul gives us some wonderful uh, teaching in this regard in the book of Corinthians, that he has an understanding, you could say, his faith is weak. I don't know that I would even say that, but from Paul's perspective, he would, to say, yeah, he's got a bit of a misunderstanding. But should we damage our, our brothers and sisters, I think, that it, 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 and offend them just because we can, because of our freedom to make another stumble? Nope. That is straight from the book of Corinthians, and that is that would be a sin, I believe, to to just blatantly so to just be careful with that. I know it's a challenging situation because I use it all the time, but I also know that if I were in the presence of a Jew who was an Orthodox Jew, and there, believe me, ladies and gentlemen, there are plenty of Orthodox Jews, whether secretly or openly, who are Messiah Yeshua worshipers, and they do not, under any circumstances, utter the name of God, like we do. And they would find that to be terribly offensive. Uh, and, and frankly, very possibly a sin. So, be careful. Just be careful about that. Be loving. Be kind. So, if you are... You know, don't go. My my advice was, if you go to Israel and you're cruising the Jewish quarter in uh, Jerusalem, don't be walking around, you know, proclaiming the name. <laughs> you like you might get stoned to death <laughs> in Jerusalem. But seriously, be careful with that. Um, just my two cents. There it is. Now, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is interesting because in our previous instruction, the book of Leviticus regarding an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, it seemed to be talking about uh, you know, making sure that the punishment fits the crime. Okay, But here, it literally seems to be saying, just as he has done, so it shall be done to him. If you burn somebody, you're going to get burned. Uh, nobody actually believes that that's what this text is saying. Although it does seem to be saying it just as clear as day, no one actually believes that that's what it's intending to say. We don't have any examples in the Torah, the writings, the prophets, the Tanakh, uh, the Talmud. None of the Jewish writings ever say that this was ever done and that this was what God meant to inflict on somebody what was done to you. And our, our Messiah, Yeshua, also would negate that for, from his own mouth, in his own teachings from the book of Matthew. So I would say, you know, don't trouble yourself over this. I feel very confident, and you should too, I think. You look into it a little deeper, but this is not saying what it seems to be saying. I don't, I don't really have anything other than that to say in that regard. Uh, it's just a, just a weird little passage. Um, that is all I have for you folks. I'm going to wrap up here.